police officers pulled us over for no reason. No reasonable person in contemporary America can watch that video and believe that the same thing would have happened to two young white men at the hands of the police. You see this? I was sentenced for uh, driving without a license. I've been here for uh, two and a half months. We incarcerate more people in America than any other country. And so all of those people will have an almost impossible task at trying to move up socially. When I was living over here, I had no future. Because everything I wanted to do was being told no. If we invested in building an infrastructure that could support these kids, they're so much less likely that they'll end up in the justice system. We have a criminal justice system that we are overusing to respond to basic needs, to basic issues, human behavior. I wasn't given the chance to learn from it, you know? I had to learn a very hard lesson. Our society fails the people who have made a mistake, clearly, um, but that mistake usually has a life sentence. In 2014, close to 42,000 people were incarcerated or on parole in Colorado. Once in the system, moving on is a hard task. In fact, a third of Coloradans have a criminal record. That's a million and a half people, and that includes people with minor arrests and people with felonies. The burden of that record disproportionately falls on people of color. In this state, black adults are six times more likely to be incarcerated than whites. Latinos are nearly one and a half times more likely. All that leads to the question, why? Part of the answer is bias that we carry around without realizing it, says Colorado Department of Public Safety head Stan Hilke. Implicit bias occurs in, in all of us in one way or another, in education, in, in, uh, in law enforcement, in criminal justice. So you can see how the dominoes start to fall if something starts off with some implicit bias. 531 to 23, can you cover me on the traffic stop over here? Was implicit bias at play here? What's the reason why you pulled this over, officer? It's 11 a.m., March 25th, 2015, in Colorado Springs. That's Ryan Brown. Behind him, a Colorado Springs police officer with her gun out. My brother is being put in handcuffs. We're pulled over for no reason. Ryan's brother, Benjamin Brown, is being patted down by Officer David Nelson, who initiated the stop. He still had not identified why he's pulled this over. They had gone really on a very brief trip. Uh, they went to a bakery. They picked up some bread and were returning to their home. They were only a block from their house when they were... Uh, stopped by Officer Nelson. In police internal investigation records, Officer Nelson explained he stopped the men because I thought they may be involved in some drug activity or some kind of criminal activity. At that point in the stop, Officer Nelson says he was thinking about the recent racially charged events of Ferguson, Missouri. I was trying to handle it with kid gloves as much as I could. He would not show his hands, and he kept on fiddling around with his crotch. I thought it's time to get them out of the car. Am I am, am am I being placed under arrest? You're not under arrest. I'm What's the, the I'm I'm I'm, I'm asking I'm asking for the reason why we're being pulled over. Okay, you have know. still failed what? to identify why you have pulled this over. I'm not pulling you. You're you not pulled, come on up. Why are you pulling me out of my I'm car, sir? Re, re, take just your trying. hands off of me. No, you're I have not did nothing. I have not did nothing. I have no weapons. I have no weapons. You have no reason to pull me out of the car. This is assault. Turn around. Turn around. Turn around. You see this? You see this? Excessive force. In the end, Ryan got a ticket for interference with a public official. Benjamin got a ticket for a cracked windshield. The men complained to the police about the stop. The Colorado Springs Police Department would not go on camera, but in a written statement, Police Chief Peter Carey says the stop was not a matter of racial profiling or implicit bias, but he called it a stylistic difference in the delivery of police services. He went on to say these differences are not necessarily policy violations. The department sent Ryan a letter saying the act complained of did occur, but was justified, legal, and proper. And I think 
that sends a message to all young people in Colorado Springs, especially young people of color, that they can uh, expect this kind of treatment from Colorado Springs police and it will be uh, approved all the way up the chain of command. And that is really unacceptable. Come on up. Not being white makes you automatically suspicious because of the stereotype of what criminality is. And so what starts the criminal justice system moving in the first place is an arrest. Certainly if we have police that are initiating contact because of color, uh, that is something we can directly influence and, and deal with and, and, tr and train and try to get our police officers to understand their implicit bias. To say that an officer would react strictly based on the ethnicity, um, I don't believe so. We look for stuff, you know, we look for things that are suspicious. Brandt says the problem isn't biased policing, but poverty-stricken urban areas with few opportunities for people to move up and lots of crime. About 70% of all arrests in this country are of Caucasian people, um, but there's still this perception of inequity in, in uh, the criminal justice system. Um, I don't think it rests on the police. Um, I don't think that's where the issue is. I think there's much broader social issues attached to that. Ryan took his case to the American Civil Liberties Union. As a result, the police department dropped the charges against him. Even so, the ACLU is considering a lawsuit against the Colorado Springs Police Department for alleged racial profiling. I have not did nothing. I have no weapons. I have no weapons. Crystal McKelvey still likes to read books with her kids and nieces, even though now she's in Denver County Jail. Mud in your hair. <laughs> An organization called the Empowerment Program helps moms behind bars record books on CDs to send to their children. Enjoy your time spending it together and be happy. <laughs> Back at home is Crystal's daughter, Armani, two nieces, and her son, Dominique. Across the U.S., over 10% of black children have a parent who has been to jail or prison. For white kids, it's nearly half as much. That was a book about mud. I love you guys so much. Over 10 years, Crystal's record lists 18 traffic arrests. I was sentenced for uh, driving without a license. Mostly for infractions and driving without a license. They just stopped me for frivolous things like, you know, having a cracked windshield. Um, one bright light on, uh, no light on my license plate, a blinker was missing, you know, and they just, and so I just, it was hard for me to catch up playing my fines. Crystal says she still had a job to get to, so she says she kept driving and trying to pay fines, over $4,000 in all. Finally, in 2015, she was sentenced to an ankle bracelet for the third time, but she drove again. Police stopped her, and she went to jail. She was four months pregnant. For months, Armani and Dominique have been waiting to have their mother back. I'm just so glad that she's coming home. Can I see another book, Grandma? It's okay. Grandma. Tomorrow, she's finally coming home. Early in the morning, Crystal's fiance, Antonio, picks her up from jail. You're absolutely depleting communities of color of um, natural resources like fathers, natural resources like good neighbors, like babysitters. It is emotionally taxing to take the father out of the household. It's emotionally taxing to take the mother out of the household. When she finally walks in, her son can't hold back the tears. <laughs> It's absurd to think that that community or that family can just forget about it or just go on without them. I'll never make that mistake, you guys. I love you. Oh, love yes. you too. <laughs> oh, look how tall you are. Demetrius Snell grew up on this block in Denver's Northeast Park Hill. He says his stepdad abused him, and he lacked the basic things like family time and help with homework. When I was living over here, I had no future, because everything I wanted to do was being told no. And when you're a child and you get told no so many times, 
It's just pretty much that's what you expect is a no. It's like when I wanted to play football, they said no, and they didn't want to pay out the $55 so I could get my sports equipment. And I'm like, what can I do? So I come out here and play with the neighborhood friends, the ones that didn't get in trouble. Then I got bored with them. I go run, play with the neighborhood friends that like to get in trouble. It may be a little decision that I'm going to hang out with this kid and we're going to steal this, and, but that all increases your chance of getting arrested for that crime. University of Colorado research from 2011 says Demetrius's childhood put him at risk for violence. Kingston says a lot of factors in your childhood can push you to succeed or to struggle. If you don't have the resources you need to fight that arrest or those supports, that could start spinning out into a, a huge issue in the justice system. Demetrius's home life was violent. It got so bad he went to a foster home for a few years. Demetrius says he found lots of opportunities to get into trouble. Demetrius and a friend stole drugs from a neighbor and started selling them until he got caught. At this very pillar, I remember going inside my right hand and just throwing it inside the trash can. And Albert Baca was right there, he seen me, so he's like, oh, what you throw away? Came in, reached down, picked it up, and there it was. And we just walked this straight path into them doors over there. That was the last time I set foot on this high school right here. Instead of heading to graduation, many people like him find themselves caught in the justice system. Of everyone sentenced for a crime in federal court in Colorado, 25% of them were people of color who lacked a high school education. For Demetrius, his problems got worse when he robbed a friend at gunpoint, all over $50. So I pulled out my gun from my inside coat pocket, and I was like, man, give him the money that you owe. You know, and he was shocked, frantic. When we're looking at violence, we're looking at incarceration and those kinds of issues, we're seeing kind of the tip of the iceberg. And what we're, we're not seeing the problem behaviors and the issues that are underneath that iceberg. In Demetrius's case, he says it was his childhood abuse, being expelled from high school and believing he had no opportunities but to sell drugs. We need to address those underlying issues and until we address those issues, we're not, we're gonna keep fighting. <laughs> we're not gonna really address the root causes of those problems. But we spend more money on punishment than prevention. According to a 2009 study from Vanderbilt University and the University of Maryland, society spends big bucks for one young person who becomes a repeat offender, up to $5.3 million per young person. It's huge. The costs are, I mean, I can tell you the costs are huge. If we invested those costs in building an infrastructure that could support these kids, they're so much less likely that they'll end up in the justice system. It put me on a harder path of a struggle because, you know, it took away so many opportunities for me to work at jobs. So I couldn't work at no more jobs that had anything to do with money, uh, people's identity. Despite his past, Demetrius takes responsibility for what he did. He started selling drugs again, went back to prison, then got out, violated parole, found himself back in prison. And it's going on 20 years. 38, I'm supposed to be having my own house, own car, family kids going to college or about to get out of high school. Instead, I had to spend 20 years rebounding, making up for lost time. And it's harder and harder and harder. For 50 bucks, I made my life live in hell. Yes. Hey folks, today. It's gonna be for here to go. This job is a big step forward for Isaac Sanchez. When he was a teenager, he says he beat up a guy his girlfriend was dating on the side. And overnight, 
you know, my life changed. So all of a sudden I was a felon. Isaac went inside her house and took some gifts back. He was convicted for felony trespassing and assault and sentenced to 90 days in jail, work release, and three years probation. We call it almost like a lifetime sentence because even if they complete their incarceration period, period once they get out and re-enter back in the community, the fact that they have that criminal background literally just provides too, so many barriers. Now you don't want to share your food? Can I try? The disparities that occur in the criminal justice system have a disparate impact overall. You know, not only just in the individual, but their families. Isaac and the millions of other Americans labeled felons are shut out from society in literally hundreds of ways. <laughs> so when women or men come home from prison, one of the things that our society fails at is in allowing them a clean slate. Oftentimes, what we call that is a social death. People with a felony record can't do things like live in public housing, get food stamps, or even adopt a child. A long list of jobs is hard, if not impossible, to get, like being a landlord, firefighter, attorney, taxi driver, bingo caller, electrician, social worker, barber, or federal employee. So our society fails the people who have made a mistake, clearly, um, but that mistake usually has a life sentence. My adult life just began, and I'm, I'm already um, part of, of a class that I felt like I didn't belong to, but I, I already was, you know. And they don't ever go away, you know, they, unless you, you have help, and it really changed, like maybe this is who I am, maybe I'm just like a, a criminal, you know, who <clears throat> maybe I'm not destined for greatness, <laughs> you know. Isaac says he turned to drugs to cope with life after his felony. Now, he's a recovering heroin addict. It didn't matter if I was in debt. It didn't matter if I was a felon. It didn't matter if I lost everybody I loved because heroin made me feel like I was loved. Isaac got clean in 2015. He's on his way to pick up medicine, called Vivitrol, to stop heroin cravings and to see his doctor. In the past, he used to lie and steal for his habit, committing petty crimes at local stores. Go to like Walmart, the box of diapers, and my son, tell him I need money for diapers. Taking tip jars from all these little restaurants. Drug problems often lead to problems with the law. Over the last 25 years, police have taken on more and more and more and more responsibility. Um, our job is no longer simply law enforcement and peacekeepers. Um, we have to deal with mentally ill. We have to deal with rampant drug addiction. And we're the ones that are on the front lines of all that. And the training our officers get, it seems like every year we're getting more and more training for our officers. Um, and we're taking on increasing responsibility. And that means people with drug problems are ending up in jail. 74% of the Colorado inmate population had a substance abuse issue in 2015, according to the Colorado Department of Corrections. Today, Isaac yeah. is on a tight schedule. Um, they sent one over to Belmont. Why would they do that? It's Isaac Sanchez, how are you? Hey, what's going on? The, uh, the Vivitrol is at the Belmont Pharmacy, not the Highway 50 again, so I gotta go all the way to Belmont now to pick up my script. I will be there as soon as I can. <sighs> it's okay. See, now I've gotta find healthy ways to deal with my stress instead of turning to the drugs. How much do you think about heroin? Oh, rarely ever. When, only when I talk about my sobriety is when I think about using or anything like that. I'm just glad that you're doing so well. Yeah. Okay, Thank so you. she's going to come in and give you the shot. Okay. Um, and then as soon as you're done, then just back in a month, bud. Yeah. All right. Sounds good. And what we know is that public health strategies uh, also so promote good. public safety. Okay, so let's do that. Because if that young man or gentleman would have got the treatment that he needed, community is safer because he's healthy. We'll see you back in a month. Awesome. Thank you. Is there a path forward? We know it's easy to get involved in the criminal justice system and hard to get your life back on track, especially if you're a person of color. The cost in dollars and lives is steep. Where do we begin to look for solutions? I would start at the budget. I would start at what our investment is in this criminal justice system and see if it makes sense. You know, if you had an investment portfolio, you know, and people were saying, how are you spending your money? 
and taxpayers really took a critical look at where's our money going. The Department of Corrections accounts for 8% of the state's general fund, or $781 million, in 2015. Spending has gone up along with Colorado's prison population. In 1985, the state legislature doubled sentence lengths for felonies. In response, the number of prisoners in Colorado skyrocketed over 600 percent over the next two decades, when the state's population grew 57 percent. Now, on average, one prison inmate costs taxpayers over $36,000 a year in Colorado, more money than a year of in-state tuition at the University of Colorado or Regis University. In 2016, lawmakers renewed their focus on criminal justice reform, including shortening some sentences and tracking data on racial profiling. The legislature also considered a bill to help people shut out of employment because of the stigma of a criminal record. In 2015 and 2016, volunteers across Colorado helped people like Isaac at free legal clinics to start sealing their records so they could truly get a second chance. You're doing God's work. I appreciate right, yeah. it. Right. <laughs> Law enforcement agencies across Colorado are starting to make changes, too. Police agencies are doing everything we can to show, look, we're trying to respond to the concerns of, of the people we serve. According to a survey by the Police Chiefs Association, over a dozen police departments have training on de-escalation and implicit bias, or they plan to start that training soon. Our society is saying we don't like the way police use force. We have to listen to that. We're here to serve them. We can always do better, and we can always learn. Others, like Beverly Kingston, are looking to prevent violence by strengthening communities. We've got to build an infrastructure, just like we have an infrastructure for our roads. We need an infrastructure for prevention that's like foundational in every community, and we just invest in it and put it in, make it happen. The residents of Denver's Montbello neighborhood run a program to prevent youth violence, working with partners like the Boys and Girls Club. Beverly Kingston is looking to start the same kind of program in Demetrius's old neighborhood, Northeast Park Hill, too. Oh, yeah. The Colorado Department of Public Safety has a commission on criminal and juvenile justice. It has a smaller subcommittee to find solutions to minority overrepresentation in the criminal justice system. That group is on permanent hiatus. Hilke became the chair in 2014 and explains what happened. The ebb and flow of the workload in criminal justice goes up and down. And there are, it's just, uh, there was a lot of work done on it initially, uh, prior to my time here, but prior, uh, you know, that when it, when it was first formed. Once the subcommittee made one round of recommendations to the legislature, it disbanded. Hilke says the larger commission will keep working on the problem. Some of that work, you know, does address minority overrepresentation. It's not neatly tucked into the title of the Minority Overrepresentation Committee. Racial equality is also up to individuals, says Professor Allison Cotton. It's very important for you to learn to stop seeing other colors and other ethnicities as bad or undervalued or different from you. Knock, knock. Who's there? The, the interrupting cat. The interrupting <laughs> Every child, whether black, white, Asian, Hispanic, Native American, wants to learn, wants to be loved, right? Um, if you look at children playing, they don't care who plays. Community dialogue, like this event, can help neighborhoods organize and push for change. Beverly Kingston says. There's a lot of power in getting organized. And then if you get organized and you match that with the science, that is a very powerful approach. Isaac, Demetrius, and Crystal are trying to leave behind their experiences with cops, courts, and incarceration. They're moving on with their lives. This guy right here has kept me busy and, you know, he's, he's put a lot of smiles on my face um, just to see remind myself of like what innocence I may have had. <laughs> After three years of smoking heroin, shooting up heroin, doing terrible, filthy things for heroin, I ended up uh, going to jail and that's how I got clean. I got on a program and I've got 10 months successfully clean now. So, and it feels good. 
You know, I'm, I'm happy to say that, but I have a long way to go. A success for Demetrius is having a job and his own apartment, even though it means commuting for hours on the bus. It's an arm and a leg for a single man, three bedrooms, 1400. Nice patio, nice view of the mountains. It's a place he says he's struggling to afford, and the only one with his criminal record he could find. And just, this is me. So as long as I got a place of my own delay, I don't got to worry about committing criminal activity because the state of deprivation don't set in, so I'm not being deprived. And as long as I'm not being deprived, then I'm not going to get desperate. But within months, the bus ride proves too long, and he's jobless and staying with friends again. Meanwhile, Crystal, who just got out of jail, is wasting no time reconnecting with family. Can't hit the books like me. Can't name day like me. Can't do the shuffle like me. Including watching her daughter's latest dance routine and planning family time. We're going to the rodeo. Yeah, we're going to the rodeo. The rest of the family can't let Crystal go. The family is whole again. You weren't the only one locked up. We were locked up with you.